In sexual violence cases, many see justice as the accuser's destination, with the justice system's job being to get her there. Nothing could be further from the truth. Justice is achieved by competing a quest for the truth of the matter through due process of law and then acting reasonably and fairly in response to what is found. HBR Talk with Hannah Wallen Ethical criminal investigation involves unbiased examination of all of the available evidence in an effort to find out what is true so that any actions taken based on the investigation's conclusion will be fair and just. That begins with the presumption of innocence, so that any determination of guilt must be based on solid evidence, not simply a result of the accusation itself. This has been a fundamental aspect of the U.S. justice system from the nation's beginning. While it is not directly stated in our Constitution, it is an indispensable part of the standard that is. Due process of law, guaranteed in both the 5th and 14th Amendments. This starting point exists to prevent wrongful conviction of the innocent and to prevent wrongfully burdening individual citizens with the obligation to do the extensive and expensive work of investigation, evidence gathering, and documentation required of the parties saddled with the burden of proof, a condition which would overwhelm the resources of the average citizen when pitted against the resources of authorities handling a case. Our founders wanted the nation's justice system to rely on evidence and logic, not be a machine for railroading innocent citizens subject to prosecutorial abuses. Without it, criminal allegations would easily become a weapon that could be deployed in order to drain an individual's resources and impose harsh punishment regardless of guilt or innocence. This is so vital it's recognized as an international human right under the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 11, which states, Everyone charged with a penal offense has the right to be presumed innocent until proved guilty according to law in a public trial at which he has had all the guarantees necessary for his defense. This basic human right is accepted throughout First World nations as an indispensable standard within any justice system. It's a measure of a nation's treatment of its citizens. So why is the U.S. Department of Justice supporting a massive attack on it? Stop Abusive and Violent Environments, also known as SAVE, has been sounding the alarm on the department's funding of a campaign against the presumption of innocence titled Start by Believing. According to the campaign's website, Start by Believing is, quote, a public awareness campaign launched by End Violence Against Women International, or EVAWI, started in April 2011. The explanation goes on to state, it was created to end the cycle of silence and change the way society responds to sexual assault. Start by Believing reaches friends and family members, as well as professionals who interact with sexual assault survivors. The campaign focuses specifically on changing the response to a disclosure of sexual assault victimization by expressing belief and support rather than doubt, shame, and blame. In other words, it is a campaign promoting automatic belief whenever a woman levels an allegation of sexual assault. We often hear in debate with feminists that this standard, which they've been arguing in favor of for years, would only apply to therapeutic settings. That is not the case with this initiative. From their website, quote, Most campaigns involve professionals from a variety of disciplines, including law enforcement, victims' advocates, healthcare workers, prosecutors, and social service agencies. Depending on your campaign focus, you may also consider local colleges or universities, military installations, local businesses, and more. That's a far cry from limiting the standard to a therapeutic setting. Instead, the group is advocating for a community-wide refusal to give the benefit of the doubt to anyone who any woman accuses of sexual assault. In addition, Ivawi has published guidelines for law enforcement methods of investigating sexual violence complaints with a goal of increasing convictions. As SAVE Services reported, SBB's Effective Report Writing Manual tells investigators to begin the probe with an initial presumption of guilt and then to 1. Conceal inconsistencies in the complainant's statements SBB advises investigators to minimize the risk of contradiction by not writing a detailed report for any victim or witness who has already provided a detailed written summary of events. 
Should there be inconsistencies in witness or defendant statements, investigators should highlight those that corroborate the victim's statement. 2. Make the sexual encounter appear to be non-consensual. SBB advocates making sure the incident does not look like a consensual sexual experience and making the complainant appear more innocent. 3. Slant the report. Investigators should focus on witness statements that serve to corroborate the victim's account. In other words, as highlighted by SAVE, the SBB's guidance encourages law enforcement to manipulate the case to create the appearance of guilt while concealing anything that might indicate the accusation is false. The article goes on to point out the publication's egregious lie about the intent behind this advice, wherein Ivawi claims their standards aren't about instilling bias, railroading the accused, or causing sexual violence allegations to be treated differently than any other criminal allegation. No bias? Not different? Really? Can we expect, then, that if a woman who has leveled a demonstrably false accusation of intimate partner or sexual violence is accused of filing a false charge, lying to police during an investigation, perjury, or harassment of her target, the same system will start by believing her accuser? That nobody will argue that she is being railroaded? How about if feminist-led organizations that purportedly offer services to female victims of violent crimes are accused of abusing their tax-exempt status by disguising political propaganda outlets as public service organizations? Does this standard apply to them as well, or do they deserve the presumption of innocence? Of course it wouldn't apply. Should feminists face the standard they want applied when women make allegations against men, suddenly its unfairness would become obvious to them and their protests would be loud, clear, and in your face. Supporters of this campaign will argue that it's different with sexual violence allegations, claiming false ones are too rare to be concerned about. If that were true, it would not change the importance of evidence-based investigations. Let's say, for the sake of argument, that only one in a hundred allegations actually turns out to be false. How does that make any individual false allegation any less wrong, any less serious, or any less harmful to the victim? the falsely accused? Does he suffer less because of the rarity of his plight? Does the supposed fact that other accusers are honest reduce the damage done to this victim's life? How about we apply the same standard to rape? If we get its occurrence down to one in a hundred women, can we just let it go and not prosecute the perpetrator in that one simply because the crime is rare? Again, I am certain feminists wouldn't accept applying that argument both ways, and they shouldn't. The rational response would be to abandon it altogether, because the prevalence of a crime doesn't determine how objectionable individual instances of it might be. Even if it did, the assertion isn't true. The number is actually unknown. Various studies have come to conclusions regarding how many accusations can be proved false, with estimates ranging from 8% to about 65%, and the justice system has come to conclusions regarding how many accusations can be proved true. That would be the conviction rate. But there is a large body of undetermined cases in between those two points. The start by believing narrative is nothing more than a demand that the human right of due process be set aside so that more of those undetermined cases can be put into the convictions category regardless of whether the accused are guilty or innocent. If investigations are to be biased to avoid exposing liars with investigators more focused on acting as would-be therapists than information gatherers, why even bother going to court? Why not just haul off to jail anyone any woman points her finger at while stating her complaint? We're already in a legal environment in which there are limitations on the presentation of exculpatory evidence and the right of the accused to cross-examine the accuser in sexual violence cases. Now we have the presumption of guilt as a starting point. If an accusation is false, how do proponents of this initiative propose to avoid false conviction and wrongful imprisonment of the accused? Magic? Not railroading? Hell yes it is railroading, in the most deliberate manner, if not outright binding of the accused to the track and running a train on his civil rights, and they're getting the fuel for the engine right out of the deep pockets of the very government that is supposed to be protecting those rights. It's definitely time to put on the brakes.